It was beautiful music today. We're going we're gonna to need a bigger ensemble area here soon. My, uh, my oldest son, when he was about five years old, uh, began to study at a karate school. And he did that through the time he was a teenager. It was a friend of mine. He was a sheriff's deputy, and his kids also went to that same uh, karate school. So we would sit and you know, talk sometimes. We were waiting for our kids. And sparring was a, was a part of that program. It is of most martial arts schools. And uh, as our kids got older, every once in a while, uh, my friend Steve and I would dust off our old karate uniforms and we'd go take class with them, particularly in the sparring at times. And Steve would, sp- uh, would spar with my son sometimes. Now, they're not you know, really going at each other, but they're trying to, uh, to score points. And Steve told me one time, as my son got to be older, he said, I hate sparring with that guy. And I said, why? He said, because, he said, when, when, whenever, whenever the match starts, he said he comes in and he pokes and then he steps back, he said, and I can see his eyes probing me for weakness. He said, to find where my weaknesses are. He said, and it's unnerving. We don't like our weaknesses exposed. Um, our experience is that when our weaknesses are exposed, somebody exploits them. And sometimes that's deliberate to achieve a certain goal. And so it's best we've you know, learned to keep our weaknesses hidden because for, for some diabolical reason, a lot of people, even if they don't have a, a reason, a goal that they're trying to accomplish, if they, if they see a weakness, they'll move in to exploit it. It's like, it's like sharks with blood in the water. 2 Chronicles 16.9 says, The eyes of the Lord roam the whole earth. God sees your weakness. And he sent his son into the world to expose your weakness, not to harm you, but to save you. Because we were not created to be self-strong. Jesus exposes our weakness, not to exploit it, but to fill us with his strength. And and we we see that particularly in the events surrounding what, what, what looks like the hour of great weakness. We've been reading the Gospel of John. We've only got a few chapters left. There are only 21 chapters in the Gospel of John. We're up to chapter 18, and I'm going to read today from John chapter 18, verses 12 through 27. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Now, Caiaphas was the one who advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. And Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus because this disciple was known to the high priest. He went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the girl on duty, Uh, there and brought Peter in. You are not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. And Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I've spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues and at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I have said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what it was. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? 
Then Annas sent him, still bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood warming himself, he was asked, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Brother, your word tells us that uh, we are open and laid bare before the eyes of you with whom we have to do. And Lord, that's that's an uncomfortable feeling. But Father, uh, help us to seek it today. Help us to be exposed by you. In your word, expose our weakness. And then Father, in that weakness, give us the strength of Jesus. for your glory and for our good, and for the sake of him and his kingdom. Amen. We hate our weakness to be exposed, but God aims to do it. And to perceive our weakness, we need to know what strength really looks like. You see, what the world thinks is strength, and sadly what Christians too often think is strength, God says is weakness. And the things that the the world sees as weakness, and I'm afraid Christians too often see as weakness, well, God says that's where strength is. What the world thinks is foolish, God says is wise. And we have strength only as we embrace our own weakness. In fact, that's a principle that we find in the Bible, that our, that our strength is perfected in weakness, that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. The Apostle Paul faced an unknown condition. He speaks about it in 2 Corinthians 12. I say unknown, it wasn't unknown to him, but, but people debate what it was that he was dealing with. And it made him despair of any hope in himself, any hope in the world. And and what's the remedy for that, you know, when you you face something like that? That People will say, toughen up, get strong. But listen to what the Apostle Paul reports about what happened. Paul says this, he says, "To, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations I received, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. That's what people don't know what Paul's talking about there. There's some debate. Some people think it's a spiritual thing. I tend to think that it's a physical thing that he dealt with that made him feel weak. And he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, listen to this, he says, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. Can you imagine saying that? I delight, I delight in weakness. I delight in insults. I delight in persecutions. I delight in difficulties. But Paul says, he gives the reason why he says this. He said, for when I am weak, then I am strong. God's power is made perfect in weakness. And if you don't believe that, you need only look at the unfolding of what happens with Jesus. Jesus calls you, Christian, to walk no path that he himself has not walked. In fact, that's what it means to be a disciple. It means to walk in his steps. So Jesus calls you. He tells you, love your enemies. You know why? Because he's loved his enemies. 
The Bible tells you don't return evil for evil or insult for insult. My, would there even be a talk radio industry? Why is that? Because Jesus refused to turn, return evil for evil or insult for insult. And the strength of God is displayed in human weakness, even in the humanity of Jesus. And so as the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching, well, maybe Jesus isn't really the one to question there. I mean, if he's concerned, there were many witnesses. That's what Jesus says. He says, I've, I've spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where, where all the Jewish people come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. They'll know. When Jesus said this, one of the officials struck him in the face. This is the way you answer the high priest, he demanded. And Jesus said, if I said something wrong, testify as to what was wrong. But if I've spoken the truth, why do you strike me? There's strength in truth. Truth is powerful. David says of God in Psalm 51, he says, Behold, you delight in truth. Jeremiah asks, O Lord, do not your eyes look for truth? And Zechariah tells us, love truth and peace. There's strength in truth. We don't quite believe that, not in the power of truth alone. We we believe in the the, the power of truth plus power. We think it's truth plus the exertion of our will. Some people think it's truth plus rioting and protesting. The power of Jesus' earthly life and ministry was found in truth and in the strength of humility. You know, I look at this and I marvel without even understanding or really caring what Jesus was teaching or doing. Annas and Caiaphas were afraid. You can, you can read it in the earlier chapters. They were afraid that Jesus would destroy the very comfortable unholy alliance that these holy men had brokered with the Roman bureaucrats. They were afraid it might jeopardize the whole Judean political religious enterprise. And so Caiaphas had observed, look, it would be better for one man to die for the people than for all the people to perish, than than for this to all crumble. And Jesus would stand before Governor Pilate, not not long after this, before Pilate who, knowing Jesus' innocence, knowing Jesus' innocence, would condemn him anyway. Because, and I'll tell you, there's, there's there's a lot of history outside the Bible about Pontius Pilate's governorship. He was governor there for 10 years. It was politically the only choice open to him. If if Pilate didn't condemn Jesus, he very well may have lost his life under Tiberius. He would have certainly lost his governorship. And yet, for none of these authorities or for any of their actions, do the words of Jesus contain even a hint of contempt. Jesus told us that the meek will inherit the earth. Why did he say that? Because he's meek. And so in Jesus, we see that there's strength in truth plus a submission. So he allows himself to be led away 
by earthly kings, even though he is the king of kings. Isaiah says about him, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. When he was arrested and his disciples wanted to fight, Matthew records him saying, don't you think I could appeal to my father and he would send 12 legions of angels? Jesus doesn't fight, not because he can't, because he won't. In accordance with God's word, he submits himself to the earthly authorities established by God And in doing so, he entrusts himself to his father, submitting himself to the will of God. And in Jesus, we see what God's strength through human weakness looks like. We need to understand that what we naturally think of as strength is, in fact, weakness. And Jesus exposes our weaknesses, not to exploit them, but to fill us with his strength. And so while this is going on, Jesus exposes Peter's weakness. You know, Luke uh, gives us some information here that, uh, that, that John doesn't mention. John's gospel is the last of the gospels mentioned, and, uh, and, and John is assuming that his readers are familiar with the gospel accounts. There are a number of things in here that indicate that. But in uh, Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and following, uh, Jesus, as he's with his disciples, as they're sitting there at, at, at what would be their last supper with him, his disciples begin to argue with themselves, among themselves, as to who is going to be the greatest among them. Who's going to have the greatest authority? And Jesus says to Peter, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all like wheat. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. But Peter replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. That, that's, that's Peter, brash, full of audacity, full of daring. And I want to tell you that Peter is not lying. This is not some false bravado on the part of Peter. He, he spent his whole life on the water since childhood. Uh, He is a wiry, strong guy in the prime of life, and he's got a sword. Lead him to the fight, and he will engage. And Peter is willing to die for Jesus. He says it, and he means it. He's willing to die for Jesus on his own terms. He's willing to die on his feet fighting. He's quite unprepared to die on a cross. But that's what Jesus calls him to. In fact, that's what Jesus calls us all to. And in Peter's case, that crucifixion will turn out to be quite literal. You see, Peter at this point still doesn't get that he's got nothing to offer Jesus, nothing that he can bargain with. That's what we all want when we first start following Jesus. We want discipleship on our own terms. We want Jesus to add his strength to ours so that we can accomplish our purposes, so that we can get our way, so that we can impose our will. 
And that's precisely what Jesus came to remedy. And he does so by exposing our weakness. So Jesus ends up taking from Peter the only thing that he has to offer. Strong back, a weak mind, and a sword. And we've already seen uh, earlier, before this, that as they come to arrest Jesus, uh, we read in verse 10, Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, and he struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. And Jesus commanded him, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And Peter doesn't know what to do with that. See, he was, he was ready to fight for Jesus, ready to die for Jesus on his feet, ready to be strong. Put your sword away. What, what's he supposed to do? He's politically weak. All the Jews were politically weak in the shadow of Rome. But, but he's not only politically weak, he's societally weak. He's not connected. He's not like the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law. John, the other disciple who's mentioned here, he's better connected than Peter is. He's able to go in and he has to talk Peter into the place. And now he's been rendered physically weak. He's got no sword to rely on. And here he is outnumbered in the courtyard of the high priest. Where's Peter's power now? What does he have to offer Jesus now? And so when he's asked on three different occasions, weren't you with him? Aren't you his disciple? Don't you know him? His answer is, I don't know the man. See, Peter thought that his strength was to be found in what he could do for Jesus. Jesus has come to tell you that your strength uh, lies in recognizing that you have no strength, that what he said earlier is the truth, that without me you can do nothing. You can do nothing. And he's come to do for you, and then in you, and through you. You know, recently, uh, Kathy Keller, the wife of the late Tim Keller, remarked, God's people do not need to be powerful culturally or in power politically to be obedient to him and to accomplish his purposes in the world. If we want to be disciples of Jesus... We must give up trying to offer him something that we can bargain with him with. If we would really be his disciples, we must stop bargaining altogether. Stop trying to be disciples on our own terms and unconditionally surrender to him. We must give up vying for our strength and accept our weakness. As the Apostle Paul came to understand, it's only when we're weak that we're strong. Jesus exposes your weakness, not to exploit it, but to fill us with his strength. Because our weakness shows our need. You know, Peter's denials here, they're, they're reasonable. They made sense. What else could he do? It was like Pilate. Like I said, if you, if you, if, if you get to know the Pilate of his, uh, from history and what he was facing uh, outside of the pages of the New Testament, though the people who are reading the New Testament, I think, well knew it. There was nothing that Pilate could do. His back was against the wall. And Peter's denials are reasonable. They make sense. Jesus said Peter would deny him three times. And you know, when, when Jesus told him that, Peter couldn't conceive it, couldn't imagine the situation in which that could be so. Because he knew he was a strong man and he knew he had a sword. He's ready to follow 
Jesus even to death, but, but always on his own terms. Why is it that in Jesus' parable of the sower who goes out and scatters seed, that three quarters of the seed bear no fruit? Why is it that Jesus tells those who are following him, listen, I want you to understand that the gate that leads to life is narrow and there are few people who will find it? Why is it that there are so many people who claim to be disciples of Jesus today who, when pressed with the real demands that he makes, turns back, turns tail and and runs back to their monetary or their political fortresses? Most people who say they're willing to follow Jesus are willing to follow him on their own terms. And all of us, I think, if we're honest, we, we start following him in that place. But listen, my friends, we must die to that condition or we must be killed by it. Peter's denials were reasonable denials. The first denial was a strategic denial to gain entrance to the courtyard. How was he going to get in? You think they would have given him entrance if he had said, yes, of course I'm one of his disciples. And then the second denial was a a cautious denial to stave off any kind of possible trouble. The last denial was a tactical denial to keep himself from being the target of revenge because it was the relative of the person that he had assaulted. Well, you could make a case for any of these denials of Peter being wise. Well, what else could he do? But the point of it is, is that just hours later, Peter was proclaiming, I will die for you. I will die with you. I'll go to prison with you. And he could not envision any of this happening. But when Jesus told him, Peter, put up your sword, it unnerved him. And and he could see the point of dying, fighting for the kingdom. He, He couldn't see the point of allowing himself to be led as a lamb to the slaughter. In humility, in deference, in weakness. God's eyes probe for our weakness, but not to destroy us. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Jesus exposes our weakness not to exploit it, but to fill us with his strength. In his book, The Problem of Pain, C.S. Lewis writes, He says, just as a young man wants a regular allowance from his father, which he can count on as his own and from which he can make his own plans, and rightly so, for his father is, after all, a fellow creature, so human beings decided to be on their own, to take care of their own future, to plan for their pleasure and for their security, to have something of which they could say, mine. And from this, no doubt, they would pay some reasonable tribute to God in the way of time, attention, and love, but which was nevertheless theirs, not his. They wanted some corner of the universe of which they could say to God, this is our business, not yours, but there is no such corner. And Jesus calls people to be his disciples. That means embracing powerlessness. It means embracing weakness. It means embracing the cross. Now you can take that or you can leave it. Jesus will not change it. Jesus exposes our weakness not to exploit it, but to fill us with his strength. And our Father, as we examine our hearts 
the day. May they be open and laid bare before you. Lord, it may be that for some of us in those things where where, where we were self-promoting, promoting our own will and our uh, own agenda, and we thought that that was strength, Lord, help us to see that for what it really is, weakness and folly. And Father, in the, in the weakness of submitting to your will, uh, Father, though things don't go the way that we would hope or wish or like, Uh, Father, that in so doing, sometimes it it hurts. It hurts like crucifixion. Help us to submit ourselves to your will. Because, Father, in, in, in your weakness, or in our weakness, rather, in the experience of our own weakness, the only place we can find your strength. what Jesus came to teach us, to show us, and to give us. Help us to walk in the narrow way that leads to life. In his name we pray, amen.